Strom is complete bio is actually at the end of your PowerPoint handout, so you have it. But the highlights, um, he is the head of supply chain and logistics for Lake Home Industries in Elk Grove Village, as well as an adjunct professor at Elmhurst College's Supply Chain Management Master's Program. Each year, Tim mentors, mentors a group of graduate students in implementing a capstone project, and, he, and it's here that the whole handbook came to fruition. It's um, really exciting to see, we talk a lot about employment in the connected community, but it's great to see it sort of from the employer perspective, and to see how hiring people with disabilities can really improve a business. So we're really happy to see that side of the story today. Um, expanding on his work with the Hope Handbook, Tim is the co-founder of Teachability LLC, creating a means of matching candidates with disabilities with companies looking to start a disability hiring program. I'm anxious to hear about that as well. So please help me welcome Tim and Emma. I'm a Kind of share with you from an employer perspective um, our journey in developing a disability hiring program and then also um, our approach and the results and uh, what we're looking at and doing for to further into other companies so with that being said I, I want to start off today with a, uh, a little video that we created of the program that we implemented at Laco Industries <coughs> for what we're trying to do from a career standpoint. The curriculum and also the living independent piece 
morphs them together, that once they graduate in four years, they will be ready to work full time. That's my dad kind of sort of maybe glibly remarked. It's he kind of thinks this job's kind of been a godsend in my life. Well, I wouldn't have I wouldn't say I've gone that far. It's a godsend. <laughs> like maybe it's luck or some, but this is the whole first one I've job had had in life. Maybe one day I'll become a supervisor or maybe something like that, a leadership role in the future. So we'll see what happens. My confidence has grown since since I started working here. To tell you the truth, I kind of wish I had this job being like five years ago, but <laughs> it is a good job, I would have to say. I think the uh, outside here, they're doing a good job. So that's the program that we implemented at, at LACO Industry based on the HOPE handbook. Um, one of the things I, I want to share with you is LACO is a 85-year-old company, privately held. Uh, it's a global manufacturer of industrial uh, markers and plumbing supplies and, and various other types of chemical products that go out to the industrial workforce. In June 2017, we started our program. Um, before that, we had zero um, people within the organization that had any type of disability. And I'm proud to say today within our warehouse operations, 26% of our staff um, has some form of disability. Um, as companies implement types of programs, there's, there's interest in doing this, but there's always a um, question that's asked. And um, that question is, what's the return on that investment? So I want to share with you uh, on the next slide here, here's the results that we've seen since our implementation. Um, so we have seen an on-time order fill rate of 422 basis points. This means that we're getting orders in, out, and to our customers um, faster and on time, which is uh, always good. Um, we've improved our operating income um, by double digits. Um, so as you're, you're implementing programs, you want to have a return on the investment, and you also want to make sure that you're operating at where you're making money from a company perspective, and we're able to improve both of those as well as we're able to reduce our, uh, our operating cost within the warehouse by 15 basis points. And most importantly, we improved our turnover rate. So our turnover rate was about 44%, um, which is about average in the uh, industrial and warehouse space. And right now it's down to 11%, um, which is a significant improvement. Um, in fact, we're, our staffing has been stable since we put this program in place. Um, Another thing is uh, safety, you know, um, so one of the questions that was asked was would it be safe for them to work in an industrial workplace, um, there's forklifts, uh, there's machines that were making products, would it be safe? And I'm proud to say in 24 months we've had zero incidents um, within our operation. So the HOPE handbook is really an, an idea that uh, I came up with uh, many, many years ago. Uh, my journey to create a disability hiring program started in 2008. Um, I was working for a large uh, retailer and uh, Randy Lewis and Walgreens started to highlight that they were implementing disability hiring programs within their, their warehouses across the U.S. and sent out a video and that video landed um, at our executive team and they say, hey, this is a great idea. We want to do this. Um, figure this out. And one of the first questions I did was I reached out to a lot of different agencies and um, it was a great response and said, hey, we have people, here's the people we can um, have them employed. But I had one question um, that bothered me and it, it concerned me and I, I wanted to know, was my facility ready to start a display hiring program? Um, were we ready as a management team to manage differently and manage folks with disabilities, and I couldn't find anyone that could really evaluate the operation. Um, so I, I left, and I, I, my career uh, journeyed on, and I ended up working at Walgreens. So I got to learn how Randy and the team there implemented their program, their transitional work uh, group program. And we opened up uh, tours. We had lots of companies come in and tour our facilities and say, hey, this is great, we want to do this. And they had the same questions I had back in 2008. I don't know if we're ready. Um, so one of the, the nice things about being an adjunct professor at Elmhurst is I get to mentor a group of students every year on their capstone project. 
And I had an idea of, well, what, what if we look at this from a supply chain perspective and develop a handbook that could help identify how to implement a disability hiring program? And that's what we built, and we called it HOPE. We broke it into four different components, uh, hiring, opportunity, um, preparedness is uh, the most important uh, component of that, and then the execution. And then as we were authoring this handbook, we wanted to go and test an implementation, and that test was at LACO. And uh, so you're seeing the results of the work that we put into this handbook and the results of the program that we put in place. Um, the drive for hope really is, uh, right now everyone's talking about the, the unemployment rates. It's the lowest it's been since 1969. Um, and a lot of companies are having struggles in finding people um, in their traditional means. Um, so 40% of employers are having difficulty in filling positions. These signs are um, me just uh, walking up and down uh, the block that Lake is on. Um, so everyone around our building, they're out looking for people to employ and they're having struggles with this. 24% of the folks that I've seen uh, research on, um, leading reasons for not finding folks is they, they don't even have anyone applying and trying to tap into different areas and they're just not finding any uh, folks available through the traditional means. And that's where we think we can do and make a difference from an employer perspective. A lot of options that companies go through, and I went through all of these, um, uh, heading up my operation. You know, we extended overtime, um, which is great, so people are making more money, um, but we're tiring them out. Um, and everyone likes to have balance, so overtime is not always the solution. We also looked at increasing our temporary workforce and our partnerships with temporary agencies. But if there's no one in that candidate pool, it doesn't matter how many agencies you work with, there's nothing there. Um, we also looked at increasing our pay, and we increased our pay to our workforce. Um, but when you're working them overtime and they lose that balance, they're going to leave anyway. So making more money isn't always the solution. So the last one was finding an alternative pool of candidates, and that's what we looked at. We looked at can we look into that untapped workforce from a disability workforce that are very much mainly capable and willing to work. Um, but are, can we tap into that uh, within our, uh, was one of our options. So the options and the potential is the, the unemployment rate for folks that are willing and able to work that have some type of disability is more than double that of the able workforce. So there are folks out there that are willing and looking and they're looking for full-time work. Um, we just got to find those individuals and match them into the, the appropriate um, format. I'm proud to say at LACO, um, all of the folks that we have hired, they, they are working full time. They're making the same wages as everyone else in the building. Um, they're part of our union workforce. They get full benefits and uh, there is no difference between our people with disability workers or our able workers. We all look at each other as one. Out of the United States, these are some of the facts that I found, is that only 17.9% of people with a disability are employed. 10.5% um, is the unemployment rate was the last one I was able to find. And almost 40% of folks have never been employed. So if you think of the traditional means of going out and applying for a job and, and finding folks to fill your jobs, one of the things that you ask for is Tell me about your work experience. Well, if I've never been employed, how can I give you anything about my work experience? So I, to me, I see that as, as a gap um, and a barrier, and that's something that we want to overcome. Also, you know, workers with disabilities, they, they look at the traditional means. Um, most of them are companies will take a chance on them, but we'll only put you in these jobs, these tasks, um, you can work part-time. I, I don't know um, that nervous um, energy of can we really do this? And from my experience at Walgreens and at LACO, absolutely. Absolutely. These folks, um, they, they work as hard or better than some of our traditional folks. 
Um, so it's just getting over that fear of the unknown from an employer perspective. So one thing is employees with disabilities have a higher AMSMT rate than employees without disabilities. DuPont study shows that employees with disabilities are not absent any more than employees without. My personal experience, they're absent less. Um, it, it's great. I mean, the, the team that we have at LACO, they arrive 30 to 45 minutes early every day to work. And um, most of their, our traditional workforce, if they're not feeling good and they don't want to come in today, they're calling you five minutes before their shift starts. If they're going to miss a day, they're planning that out, and they're telling us two weeks ahead of time. Because um, they're worried about um, what's the perception. Um, and so it allows us to plan accordingly um, for them not be in there. So this, this absolutely is a myth in my opinion. Disabilities are unable to meet performance standards, thus making them a bad employment risk. Fact is 90% rated average or better in job performance. The folks that we have hired, they're performing better than our traditional workforce because um, they're more consistent. They have more, better attention to detail. Um, so they are, um, have learned over the years how to advocate for themselves, um, but they're also very good at advocating and saying, hey, this, doesn't, this isn't following the process that you told me. Um, so they're, they're very good at identifying that. Um, so we've seen a, a much better performance from that. Accommodating a disability hiring program is costly. This is definitely one of the things I have heard over the years. Um, fact is 78% of costs are under $1,000. 51% of them are under $500. When I implemented and prepared the program at LACO, it didn't cost us anything. All we did was we looked at our operation and we looked at our training materials and our visual controls and we just updated them. And the work that we did in preparation of starting a, hire, a disability hiring program benefited not only for those, that team coming in, but everyone within the organization. <clears throat> so it was benefited for all, all for zero cost. So what was the process that we followed? One of the first things we did is we wanted to look at the operation. So we came in and did an observation. We looked at all of the jobs within the organization and said out of the jobs, where would it be best to start a program? Instead of just taking someone and um, fitting, putting them into a job, we wanted to see where, where would it make the most sense. And uh, what we looked for is more repeatable tasks as a starting point. Um, so once we identified those areas, then we went in and did a survey, and I'll show you that survey. Um, we looked at our current staffing condition, and we also looked at the local market, marketplace for talent and see where we could we source um, folks. So from an observation process, you know, are the job tasks, it will be separated and performed by different individuals. Um, do they use computer equipment? Do you have to use forklift equipment? Um, do you need uh, math skills? All those different criteria as you're trying to look at that operation and the task within that area. Um, and then we documented those observations. After we documented those observations, then we went in and said, these are the top areas that we should focus in and dig a little bit deeper. As we did that, we did a survey, and we did a survey of the leadership team, but also the coworkers within that area and ask them some very simple questions. One is, do you know anyone that has a disability? Have you ever worked with someone that has a disability? <clears throat> Would you be willing to work with someone that has a disability? If one of your team members required assistance, would you be willing to help them and assist them? So out of these types of questions, we got to feel what out of the workforce, their peers, would they be willing to go down this journey with us? And when, after that, we um, kind of stack ranked all of the responses and determined this is the area that we should start this program because not only is the task ready for it, but the team's ready for it. Um, and that's where we kind of started. Instead of just trying to do it everywhere, we, we honed in and starting as one starting point and then perfect that and then we can build upon it. <laughs> The next phase is really the preparation, and here we broke it down into different steps of understanding the job, are there any modifications that's required, 
partner identification, most importantly, sensitivity training, and then creating a safe zone. And I'll walk through those. From a understanding of the job, so we had them come in, so they went through the new employee uh, uh, orientation when they did the actual job training. And as they were being trained, they documented the steps, each one of them, and rated them one to three. So a one is it's pretty intuitive to understand. A two is a little bit more difficult than I have to ask. A three means I needed retraining. And as what we did is, as they looked at that, the team said, all right, let's look at the threes and how do we simplify the processes to get them down to a one? And would it be training materials? Would it be visual controls? Would it be just a, a little um, checklist worksheet for someone to follow? Um, and that's kind of what we, we built um, through the, the first training process. Um, we implemented that. That was uh, one of the first steps and that was an easy step for us to do. And not only did it benefit um, our current employees, but every new hire that came into the building. <laughs> Next thing is we went out and uh, looked at how do we hire. Um, some companies, you know, in different companies follow different programs. They have a temp, um, with temp the perm program, which is a partner with temporary agent agencies. Some direct, they do direct hire. Um, as soon as you come in, you're a new employee and you get all the, the benefits and you're raring to go. And then other ones, you're, you're working through staffing agencies to find the workers for you. Um, and there's a gamut. So at LACO, most of our um, workers come in um, through a temp temporary agency. Um, and after 60 days, we start the transition process of converting them to full time. Um, for our um, PWD initiative, we brought the, these folks in direct hire um, right away because we did a, a different type of matching process um, to get them in the board and I'll show that here in a minute. And then we identified local agencies um, and with us, you know, that was the great thing of, of me working at Elmhurst College is I was able to tap into the ELSA program um, and, and hire graduates of the ELSA program as we started our journey. Um, and then we also looked for employer networks, not-for-profits. Uh, we have hired other individuals outside of the ELSA program now. Um, and it's because they've heard of the program that we are implementing and they've contacted us um, directly. <laughs> Sensitivity training with any new program requires some type of training. Um, so we focused, um, Garrett in the video talked about how we really train the management team and how to work with folks with disabilities. And um, we did a, a series of trainings and videos. Um, we did um, what if scenarios and role playing, um, all that type of stuff to uh, prepare the team. Because um, in businesses, most managers and supervisors, they don't engage with their staff unless there's a problem. Something they need to work on. And what I've learned over the years is someone that has a disability, they like the positive reinforcement. If you're only working and communicating with them when they have a problem, they internalize that and they get overwhelmed by that conversation and they feel like they're in trouble. <clears throat> and then because they fixate on that, their performance goes down because they're so worried about being in trouble. And we wanted to reteach our management staff that over communicating is a good thing. And we put in a program that we call the positive sandwich. <clears throat> so that positive sandwich is you start, whenever you interact, you start with a positive statement. Then you talk about what you should work on. And then you end with a positive statement. And we increased our communication. So instead of just talking to someone when there's a situation, it's throughout the day, hey, how are you doing? You're doing a great job today. I love your effort. Um, we need to get these orders out. Um, thank you for doing what you're doing. And just those little things throughout the day has made a big difference. <clears throat> and not only do we do this with our, our folks uh, that have disabilities, we do this with everyone. And we've seen a better performance um, across the entire board. And most importantly, we've seen and improved morale uh, across the organization. 
because they're taking more pride. One of the things that we um, also talked about is interviewing. So when you go to interview um, someone that is traditional, um, you're, you're asking a lot of questions. Tell me about your work history. Tell me what you've done. What do you like? What do you do, don't like? Um, those types of things. And sometimes you can ask lots of questions really, really fast. Um, or you don't allow enough time for someone to process and an answer. Um, so we, we found this video, I'm going to show it to you, that we showed with our management team um, to give them a perspective of someone that has a disability and how they interpret someone giving them interview questions. Congrats on all the awards. So tell me about yourself. our management teams and how to interview more effectively. Um, a, a key component that we asked the team was how many of you enjoy going in and interviewing? And when you go into an interview, you don't stress at all. And everyone's looking around and like, uh, yeah, no, none of us like interviewing. All right, now, so add an element of having a disability that had not had a lot of success in having a job or a lot of experience in working. So we wanted to put them into that situation and see it from a different way. And then we created different questions and, and allowed them to, and we did role playing with interviewing and how to take a pause and let someone answer a question. Because most of us in the, in the business world, uh, we've gone through HR hiring training. And some of the things that we have learned over the years is if someone doesn't look at you eye to eye, they're not being honest with you. If they're taking too long to answer a question, um, they're making up an answer for you. Maybe they don't know. And when you're, we, we wanted to explain and convey to the team is that some folks with disabilities take time to process how they want to answer. And they're really thinking about how to answer in an appropriate way versus making something up. And it's OK to pause and understand what they're trying to say to you. And that was a lot of the training um, that we talked about um, having some folks come in. Another component is in managing a person with disability. We are all unique in our own way. A person with a disability is no different. Everyone is unique. There's a big range of different disabilities, as you all know. Um, and everyone reacts differently in different situations. So we wanted to employ and have folks get to know each member individually and what allows them to perform at the high level and what are their stressors. And when you see what their stressors are, how do you look at them, talk to them, and put them in a, a, a safe way um, so they can work through those stressors? Um, so one of the things that we created was a safe zone. 
Um, so we took a, a conference room and converted it into a safe zone. So anyone that's having a bad moment, a bad day, and they just need some time to collect themselves, all they need to do is say a, a single word that they picked, and they can go into their safe zone and collect themselves. And uh, that was a, that's been a, a big um, success for us. Um, and for, for us, the, the team, they picked, um, the word for them is I'm having a home day. Because um, every one of them live at home. And situations that happen at home, they bring with them. And if it's a situation that's happening within their home light, they really worry about it. Um, and they, they just can't separate home versus work. Um, so when they're having those moments, and we can just tell that they're, they're distracted or they're off or, or something's bothering them, we ask them and they say, hey, we're, I'm just having a home day. So then we allow them to go in and say, do, do you want to talk about it? And it allows them to kind of get it off their chest and, and talk and then go back and focus on what they need to do so they can be safe uh, within the workplace. So those are some of the little things that we did at LACO to really prepare the team um, for, for the next phase, so that's the implementation. One of the things we did is we wanted to change the model. Um, knowing that 40% of folks um, have never had a job, so don't have experience, or they have experience in jobs, stocking shelves, bagging groceries, um, getting carts, and working in food service, they, they might not be to the best of their characteristics. And in the business world, what we have done over the years is every job that we have, we have identified job competencies. So these are the competencies that we're looking for an individual to have to be able to perform this job at a, the highest level. So we took those job competencies, and what we did was we created this form. Um, there's 20 questions on this form, and it really looks at a person's characteristics. So what are your characteristics? Are you a great listener? Are you one that can overcome um, different situations and, and problem solve? And based on those characteristics, we did a match to the job competency. So William in the video where his dad said this job is a godsend for him, um, William's 35 years old. Um, he's never had a full-time job. The longest time he's ever been employed has been six months. And most of his jobs have been stocking shelves um, in, in retail space. And what we were looking for, the job that William does, is he packs out our orders. So we, we have teams that go out and pick orders. They bring the orders to um, William and uh, some other individuals. And they look like you're um, bagging groceries at the store. How many, what size box and how many boxes do I need to overpack these products going out to our customers? So we were looking for someone that had a high level of, of detail, someone that could look at something and um, put products into a box, like packing a suitcase or packing a car, going on vacation. And um, those characteristics, we met William from ELSA. He's an alumni of the ELSA program. And we had him fill out this form from a characteristic perspective. And we found out that William loves to build scale models. Great attention to detail, coloring them, um, everything. He also has a, a, a great ability to go out and remember movies or shows that he's seen uh, that he liked over his lifetime. And he can recite um, passages or even the entire movie uh, to you. In, in, the scenes they liked. So in talking to him, we knew that he had a high level of attention to detail. And we put him in the pack job um, position that he's in today that you saw in the video. William's been there over a year. He has outperformed all of the traditional folks that we have ever staffed in that area. <clears throat> because we were able to match the job competencies to William's characteristics. And we, we saw that that was a perfect match for his skill sets. So we've done this a, a second time. We've hired a, a second individual um, that went to school and he, he got his degree in mechanical engineering. And it has the same type of uh, skill sets as William. And we put him in that job and as his journey, to start his journey um, within LACO. And he is performing um, at the same level as William. 
after a, a six week time frame. So it, it's just terrific to see that going out and changing the model and really looking at what the characteristics of these individuals are and how do we match them to the job task competencies versus taking an individual and say, I have someone, I think they would be good for this and just put them in there and try it. We really went looked at what is the, the clear match so they can be successful because their success is our success. <clears throat> and then as we're doing that, we build rapport with the, uh, the individuals through their job coach. And then I take it to the next level. I, I build rapport with their families. So I have touch points with their families just to see how they're doing, you know, what they're hearing at home. I've invited the families in to tour the facility, um, do Q&A, you know, sessions with them. And um, <clears throat> they're, they're, the responses I get from the family members is that it's usually, you know, a, a tears of joy that um, their, their child is in a place that they can start to contribute and they feel proud and they're building their confidence. And I think it's just terrific to see the development of the team um, as they build their confidence and, and really realize what their true potential is. <clears throat> the job coaching piece of it, as we implemented, we worked with individual job coaches and had them come in. Even though we simplified the training, we wanted to partner with that, that job coach as well. Um, and as we did that, we did one week of intense training and then reevaluated. If they were good, well, then we started to fade that support. If they needed more, we provided more. Because <clears throat> what we found is the more training we can do up front, the better it'll pay off in the long run. Um, so we just partnered with the job coaches that they had. Um, so the, the candidates that we, we got from the ELSA program, um, Elsa provided the uh, job coordinator um, to come out and help us. And that was Garrett who was in the video. <clears throat> now some individuals, they didn't have a job coach. They had a parent. Um, and they came in and evaluated um, if they needed a job coach or not. Um, and then we showed them how we were training and doing all the materials. And they said, no, we, we think this should be good. Um, will reevaluate if there's a need after they start. <clears throat> and then the other thing is we, we did a uh, communication. So we have, um, we have a daily meeting. So every day we start um, our shift with a daily meeting um, with everyone. And we, we talk about, you know, we're, did we accomplish our goal yesterday? So did we win? Um, were we safe? Um, were there any barriers yesterday for us to get our job done today? Here's what's on tap for us today, um, and here's what our plan is. And then we end with stretching. And then we go out and have one-on-one -on -one meetings once a week, uh, we, which each of our um, people with disabilities. And after six months of employment, what we have done is we've created um, individual development plans. So they're all used to the IEP process. And what we do is we take that into a IDP process and say, hey, this is where you are. What do you want to do? What do you want to learn? And let's develop you a plan to get there. Because there's other jobs within the operation that you may be interested in doing. So let's see if we can get you prepared to go and do other things. Instead of just pinching you whole into this one area, let's really work on your career. And lastly, so we want to move from disability to ability. So in the beginning, what we done is um, week one, we had the job coach. So Garrett was on site for the um, first week, 100% of the time. Um, the second, you know, um, as we each individual started to um, learn and develop and build their confidence, and they all progressed at different um, levels, um, which was great. Every, all of us do the same thing. Um, there's no difference there. And we started to fade the job coach um, support because they started to build their confidence and more importantly they started to build friendships among their peers um, so their friends started to help them and teach them as well <clears throat> and that's because we went out and did the survey and did the sensitivity training in the beginning and prepared everyone um, 
that we're going to do something different and we need to do this as a collective unit. And then really um, three to five months, job coach was there maybe once a week. Um, in our instance, you know, Gary would come once a month just to visit. And now um, when he comes there, everyone's like, oh, why are you here today? And usually Garrett's coming to um, provide a tour um, or we're working on other areas of the operation. <clears throat> and it's, it's really has helped us. Um, overall, the biggest takeaway for us was the more short-term work that we put in, it's been a bigger long-term gain. <clears throat> and that's changing the model. You, you have to, and that, that's what I've been sharing with businesses as they're looking at this, you're going to invest more up front, but it's going to pay back for you in the long run. These are loyal employees. They love doing what they're doing. They love having the opportunity to do something and have a chance to show that they can do something. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so in the, in the beginning, I'm, I'm part of the, the, the senior leadership team. So um, when I was struggling in hiring people and finding folks and, uh, and I wanted to bring this uh, to the company, <clears throat> uh, the reaction of, the, of our CEO um, was, hey, this sounds great, but I don't know if we're ready or if it will be successful here. <clears throat> so I said, I'm confident that we can figure it out. And he goes, I, again, I don't know if we are ready as an organization. The biggest um, return on investment that they were um, interested in was on the turnover rate. So when I was able to show that our turnover rate was 44%, and now that we're 11%, which is better than any other area in the company, that, that took notice. Uh, yep. <clears throat> yep. And then the other component was, you know, let's look at your um, productivity and then operating expense. And our productivity went up, operating expense went down. So those are some of the key indicators. Um, from the CEO that he was interested in, in seeing. Um, now that we have this program in place and I, you know, we created the video and I showed the video to um, our board of directors and the, and the owner of our company and now it's very, very proud um, of what we're doing. And um, we're, we're starting to get some accolade, accolades as well. So we won in October um, from the village of Elko Village um, a uh, best in community support for our disability hiring program. Um, so great accolades for that. And um, our new, the CEO retired, and we have a new CEO um, that has started, um, and he has a child with a disability. Mm. So he thinks this is just terrific and wants to uh, further support it and get it in every aspect where it makes sense um, across the organization. <coughs> So I'm done. I, I'm all open for questions now. I have questions in the far back. Yeah, one question I have is how long did it, get, did it take to get traction to show that it was to get it going where you could see the results from the beginning? So from the beginning, it took us to, to write the HOPE handbook. It took us about a year because <clears throat> we did a lot of research, talked to a lot of companies, a lot of agencies. Um, to really um, understand um, how we should approach it and how others have approached it um, that were successful and how others approach it that were not successful. Um, so we wanted to gauge both of those. Um, and I knew the Walgreens program pretty well. Um, the, the Walgreens program, what they did and what Randy built um, within their distribution centers is they built a mock um, DC within their distribution center. So they took the same um, jobs and material handling equipment and they put it in a room the size of this. <clears throat> and then they would bring in folks and they would be there 12 to 16 weeks learning how to operate the, uh, the different functions of the jobs. And as they built their confidence and endurance, then they would move them into um, a temporary and put the temporary out onto into real production and see how they were doing. If they were successful, then they would work towards full-time. If they weren't, they would go back into the training program. <clears throat> and what I found is that there's a lot of businesses that don't have the resources or the funding 
or the space to go build a room dedicated to training individuals. So how can you do that within your current organization? And that's what we wanted to kind of build from the Hope Handbook. We finished that in about, it was April of 2017. And then um, we kicked off the process at Lake Owen. We were live in the middle of June. Um, and really, we could have, we were ready the right around Memorial Day. Um, but we wanted the folks that we hired uh, a couple of weeks to prepare to come into um, a warehouse and manufacturing environment. So we worked, Garrett worked with them outside in pre preparing them before they walked in the door. And that took about three weeks. <clears throat> hey, there's a question here, then I'll go in the back. Oh, go ahead, sir. Can you just speak to um, your uh, workers with uh, disabilities? What, um, I guess, related to transportation, uh, how they, uh, I'm imagining there's probably a range, but like if you're aware of how they're getting to and from work, because I know that area about road does have some pace presence, so there may be options for pace with uh, other parents driving them. Are they doing like ride sharing? Are they doing other type opportunities? Because that's something that sometimes we run into. Uh, all of the above. So um, some of our folks, um, uh, they drive. Um, and they're driving from the Naperville area, Batavia area, up in the northern suburbs. Um, we have other, um, another individual that doesn't like the PACE system or Uber. So he takes a taxi every day. Um, but he has started his journey. Um, and that's Chris, the first one in the video with the safety vest on. Um, he um, has built so much confidence that he is now starting his journey to learn how to drive. And then uh, others, they have taken the, the pace or the bus system. So do you, um, do you say there's an ideal size of a company um, which this kind of model or a company can maybe look for if it's too small or too large? I, I wouldn't say there's a, a range on the size. Um, when I was at Walgreens, um, we had a facility that had 650 people uh, working within the operation uh, 24 hours a day, five days a week, and 48% of the team had some form of disability. So I, I, that's a pretty big operation. Where I've seen other ones, LACO is 175 people. Um, so I, I think it's not so much on the size, it's more about is the team ready to manage differently and have they prepared the operation to have someone um, at work to the best of their abilities. There's a question in the back. Um, yes. Um, first of all, how do we clone you? <laughs> 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 my second question is, would you, are you willing to share your Yeah, so we have, um, I, I, Linda talked about, I, I co-founded a te Teachability LLC. Um, and we're, we're in the infancy of, of building that. And the purpose of that is to do this program for businesses. Um, and the way we costed it out, um, it, it's really, we brought it down into three steps, um, which is the assessment, preparation, and then the uh, implementation. And then we have a support function. But those three phases would take about six weeks, and it only cost, depending on the size, uh, the, it would cost about the same as hiring one full-time person to start a program. Are you willing to do this at like an SBA meeting? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So we're we're working at, and I'm writing, um, I'm learning how to write a grant because um, <laughs> what I want to do is um, I love to get some grant money yeah. to go and fund implementing these in businesses that are, oh, that'd be terrific. Because there, there's a businesses, there's a fear of the unknown. And that, that's one of the things I faced at LACO was the fear of the unknown. 
Um, and how do I get over that fear? And if a company has to pay for that, they're a little bit more resistant. But if we can figure out how to tap into some grant money to say, hey, we'll, we'll get the folks to come in and do this for you, the grant will pay for it, and then we can source. And, I, and we want to partner with every agency uh, across the Chicagoland area on all the different individuals, but find the right individual to the right job. Um, and, and then expand it. So I'm mentoring a group of grad students right now, and we're, we're replicating this program at True Value out in Harvard, Illinois. Um, so we're at the phase of the preparation is done. We are ready to kick off the implementation. Um, and they're looking to have folks uh, employed um, uh, by the March time frame. Um, so that's where we're at, but we're, we're looking you know, for other components, and but we're we're starting, and there's a lot of interest. So, so I don't know if everyone heard the question. It's um, that have we partnered or thought about partnering with schools to share this program? You know, the high schools and, and younger um, to see and give them hope of what the potential of the future could be, and see role models. But we have not yet because um, we're we're really trying to focus in on getting a couple more businesses up and going um, and then start to branch out from there. Because um, the, my biggest fear is, it's been a great success at LACO, but my biggest fear is to go into a company, they go through all of these processes, they're ready to go, and the management team, they forget something. And there's a misstep and someone needs that safe zone and they're having a bad day. And that bad day now allows the people that have that fear of the unknown to say, I told you it wouldn't work. And then they stop it. So that, that's my biggest fear and I wanna put something that's robust to put in place to push through and get past that fear because we all have bad days. Whether we have a disability or don't have a disability, and we're all unique, and how do we help someone um, get through that so we have a very robust program? And that's, that's what we're, we're trying to do in the beginning, and then definitely go, go out. I know Linda has a question. Well, I do want to tell people, first of all, that the Hope Handbook is available online. I've downloaded it myself. If you have trouble finding it, just email. Oh, sorry, what was available on the whole handbook, the actual yes. handbook. Um, so if you have trouble finding it yourself online, just email us at CTC and I'll show you how to find it. But my question is, have you dealt with or do you have recommendations for people who might have great skills but they're not verbal? So they would never ever do an interview process, never ever speak the way some of the employees that you're showing, but they could still be do the job. Yeah, so that's where we found, you know, some with the characteristics. Because um, you, you know that the characteristics, they, they possess all of this. And, it, and it's going, it, and reaching out and working with the job coaches. Because the job coaches, they know those individuals. And if the job coach can give us a highlight of what we're going to um, be interviewing and a little bit about that individual, We'll have a better understanding versus just going in cold, because um, then we're trying to f figure it out. Um, so that's where we're really we have not solved that, um, but in the initial we're really working with with the the job coaches of those individuals or the family members. I mean the what, last person we just hired his name is Andrew, and his ma reached out to me randomly because she was taking a class with her son on supply chain. Um, and they wanted to know if I would um, give them some guidance on a presentation that they were doing. And then uh, she reached out to me again and said, hey, um, I saw your video and would love to know if you know of any companies looking for um, to hire someone with a disability. And I said, hey, just to let you know that we are. <clears throat> and uh, so she gave me um, great insight on Andrew and we hired him in and he's doing phenomenal. Just phenomenal. We just kicked off with, um, we're evolving our program. 
um, at LACO. So on our, one of our manufacturing lines, we're going to dedicate 90% um, of the team on the manufacturing line um, with people with disabilities. And then what we're going to do with Elmhurst is we're going to um, have a internship program um, with the undergraduates and it'll be a year-long rotating program so each of their semesters so fall spring and summer um, an undergraduate student can sign up for this internship program they would work um, five days a week six hours a day it'd be paid but they would be the job coach and liaison on this production line to get them exposure uh, management experience how to problem solve take them out of the classroom and see them right in a production environment. Um, and we're building this program now. Um, I have not found any programs like this um, as in the Chicago area or across the US. Um, so we're trying to continue to evolve and change the model. I just want to thank, thank you for what you're doing. And uh, the time has to be incredible that you're putting into it on the side. But thanks thank and you. weekends. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.